But they get you first. I know it isn't fair. I want as much time as I can get with you, but I have three other people who love me and depend on me, and I can't walk away from them and cause even more people the pain I've caused you. Why not? It's okay for me to suffer, but not them? It's not okay for you to suffer. It was never okay, but I wasn't given a choice. No matter what I did, it was inevitable that you would suffer. It didn't matter if I went into the program and lived, or if I went back to prison and died. As I look at him, I can feel the neediness expand in my soul. Its growth makes me feel like I have so much empty space that needs to be filled. I'm hollow and starved for the one thing I've been deprived of, and it's a horrible feeling I'm forced to withstand. Can I come back tonight, around ten or so? I nod, because I'll start crying if I speak. I refuse to cry, but the blades of despair are slaughtering me from the inside. Declan, my father turns from me, seeking permission from the man I love. Of course, come as late as you need. With his hands on my shoulders, he looks in my eyes with sincerity, saying, I'm sorry. And I nod again before he pulls me to him and hugs me. I take his embrace, and with a deep breath, I take in his scent once again, because the same fear remains that he just might not come back. I love you. I'm sorry, is my response. Look at me. You have nothing in this world to be sorry for. It's okay to be angry. I'm angry too. I'm pissed and bitter. I want to grab you and steal you away, do everything in my power to make up for all the time we lost. But do you understand why I can't? I do. I don't. I know it doesn't make it easier, and I'm so sorry. If I'd known that there was a chance in this lifetime that I'd be seeing you again, I would have waited alone so that nothing could stand in the way of me disappearing with you. I need you to believe that. Tell me you believe that. Taking a hard swallow, I force the words out through all the pain that's suffocating me. I believe you, Dad. Chapter 26 my dad did come back later last night, just as he promised. He and Declan talked business and politics while drinking scotch. I enjoyed watching the two of them together, debating and laughing as if they'd been friends for years. Dad wanted to know what life was like for us in Scotland, and now in London, and although our time there has been plagued by so much darkness, Declan did well to veer around all that. When Dad asked about the house in Scotland, I told him all about my time at Brunswick Hill. The history of the estate, all the amazing parts of the land surrounding it, the clinker grotto, the atrium, the library. I went on and on, because truthfully I love the house so much, it's what most little girls dream a palace to be like. The more we are around each other, the more comfortable we become. The ease of last night felt so natural and so promising. Having the two men that I love so much in the same room with me is amazing. I try not to focus on the nuts and bolts of how this is all going to work moving forward. Declan told me after my father left last night to just enjoy this time we're able to share in the here and now, and that we will figure out the details later. I accepted his suggestion to live in the moment. My father returned a couple hours ago with another bouquet of pink daisies. We've been hanging out on the couch, watching an old James Bond movie that my dad claims is one of his favorites. Once the movie ends, we order up some lunch, and are now eating our food as we sit in the living room together. Declan, tell me, are your mother and father still living in Scotland? Now it's my turn to give Declan a preemptive squeeze, like he had when my father asked me about my childhood. I'm not sure what Declan will say, but I need to let him know that I'm here. No, my mother actually passed away when I was a teenager. He doesn't say anything about his father, and when he turns away from my dad, I know he won't. Before my dad can ask another question, I turn my father's attention to me. Dad, I, um, I thought you should know that I had a friend of mine look into finding my mother. He looks at me nervously. You did? Yes, I tell him, and then add, I know what she did. Sweetheart, I'm so sorry. 
I never wanted you to know about her, because I didn't want you to think that she didn't love me, I cut in. Dad, she didn't love me. The thing is, her being sick and depressed when she sold me is one thing, but she's been a free woman for a very long time and still has yet to contact me. I don't want to make excuses for that woman and what she did. It was a rough period in our lives, one I had to move on from, which is why when you were little and would ask me if you had a mom, I would always deflect. And since you were so young, it was easy to do. I can talk about that woman without getting worked up because I've closed myself off from that facet of my life, even though it goes against Declan's word. He's made it clear that he no longer wants me to avoid that which hurts me. But my mother's truth about what she did to me when I was a baby is too painful for me to think about. And with everything else going on, Declan hasn't broached the subject of my mother since. Do you think you'll ever see her or talk to her? No. I state firmly. She's never been a part of my life, and I don't see a need for it now. I don't want to tell you what to do in this situation, but I think staying away is the best choice. I'd be afraid she'd only hurt you. Have you spoken to her since all that? No. As soon as I had you back in my arms, I was done with her, and aside from the day I had to testify at her trial, I never spoke to her or saw her again. When there's nothing else to be said, we sit in a short span of silence before my dad attempts to lighten the mood. Tell me something good, something funny from your childhood. He has no idea that there's nothing funny about my childhood. But Declan catches the conversation before it drops and says to my dad, Better yet, why don't you tell me more about Elizabeth? What was she like as a little girl? Thank you, Declan. My father's face instantly lights up with a smile as he reflects on the past. She was a spitfire of a girl, but in the most endearing way possible. So I see that part of her hasn't swayed. Declan's voice is full of humor, but I keep my attention on my father as he goes on. She didn't have any women in her life. It was only me and a couple of my good friends that surrounded her, he says, and then turns to look at me. But somehow... You were so soft and pink and everything a little girl should be. He says this with a doting smile, which makes me smile as well. He turns back to Declan and tells him, I used to have a short beard, almost the same length as yours, and one thing she would always do was rub her tiny hands over it. She'd giggle and tell me she liked the way it felt as it crackled against her palms. I look over to Declan when my dad says this, because I do the exact same thing to Declan's beard every single day. And I do it because it's always reminded me of my dad, and it simply makes me feel good. Declan gazes into my eyes and gives me a hint of a smile when he puts those two puzzle pieces together. But as girly as she was, she still wanted to be my right-hand man, he continues with a chuckle. I can remember when we moved into the Northbrook house. We didn't always live there? No. After everything with your mom, I decided it would be best that you and I had a fresh start together. I bought that house for us. I never knew that, I murmur. You were only three years old at the time, but you insisted on having a little tool belt of your own so you could help me hang the window treatments and artwork on the walls. I wound up tracking one down at a nearby toy store, and you wore it proudly as you followed me around the house. I laugh when he tells me this, saying, I don't remember that. Well, you were so young. But yeah, you'd pull out your plastic hammer and tap it against the wall every time I would hammer in a nail. He stops for a moment and smiles at me before continuing. There was one time when I had a couple buddies of mine over. Danny and Garrett. Do you remember them? I do my best to think back and vaguely recall. You mean Uncle Danny? You do remember, he says happily. Danny was a good friend of mine, and he insisted that since you didn't have any aunts or uncles, that you should call him Uncle Danny. I don't remember his face or anything, but I do remember an Uncle Danny, I tell him. He turns to Declan and explains, Danny and I had known each other since our twenties, and when it was just Elizabeth and me, he'd started to come around more often to spend time with her. But anyway, he says, shifting his attention back to the story. I was in the attic laying insulation because it was unfinished, and I wanted to turn it into a storage space. You were downstairs playing with Uncle Danny, and I had stumbled 
and my foot slipped off the rafter I was standing on, and my one leg fell right through the floor. He starts laughing. I hollered down to you two, and instead of Danny coming to help me, he took you out to the garage where my leg was hanging through the ceiling. He picked you up so you could reach me, and encouraged you to take my shoe off and tickle my foot. Declan and I join in my father's laughter as he tells this story I have no memory of. The more I laughed, the more you tickled, and the more I started to slip through. But I could hear you giggling, and you were having the time of your life. Well, it looks like your leg survived that ordeal, I tease. It did, he says, and then faces Declan. But if you really want to know what she was like as a child, she was perfect. She had the softest heart and always wanted to please people. If I told her to do something, she always did it and never fought me. She was kind, and she was sensitive, he says, and then looks at me, finishing. And she was my every dream come true. He goes on to tell a couple more funny stories, and when we finish our lunch and clean up, he turns to me and asks, You feel like getting out of here? I thought you couldn't... Forget what I said. You want to go for a walk? Um, yeah, that sounds great, Dad. It's a little cold outside but why don't I take you over to Owen Beach? With a smile, I respond, Okay, let me go change my clothes and I'll be ready. I give Declan a smile when I walk past him and into the bedroom. Closing the door, I rush into the closet like a kid about to go to her favorite candy store. I slip off my dress pants and pull on a pair of jeans before grabbing a hooded raincoat. I dig through Declan's clothes, looking for his jacket, and when I find it, I make a quick stop in front of the mirror to wrap my hair up in a bun on top of my head. As I walk out of the bedroom, I notice the two of them standing off by the door, talking in hushed tones with one another. What are you two talking about? I announce as I approach, and when Declan turns to me, I hold his coat out and wait for his answer. You, of course. I narrow my eyes at him in mock annoyance, and then laugh when he kisses me. I don't have a whole lot of time before I have to leave, so why don't we take two cars for time's sake, and I'll just leave from the beach. Not a problem, Steve. We'll just follow you there. The drive is a short one, and pretty soon we're driving among fresh blooming buds of spring. The sky may be dank and gray, but the pink cherry blossoms make the gloom beautiful. I press my hand onto the window, absorbing its bitter chill as Declan pulls into a parking spot that looks over the desolate beach. My dad opens his door next to our car, and when he opens my door and takes my hand, Declan says, I'll wait here. I look over my shoulder. You sure? I need to make a few calls, he says. Go share a walk with your dad. Hand in hand, we walk over the mounds of driftwood on the beach and down to the water's edge. The wind gusts, creating a mist of sea spray that mingles with the cloud sprinkles that fall from the sky. I reach back with my free hand and pop the hood of my raincoat over my head as we stroll leisurely across the dense, water-puddled sand. Is this where you came when you left prison, or have you lived in other places? Only here. I love it. The mountains, the water, the gray. I love the cold. I do, too. Winter has always been my favorite for some reason. Maybe it's because it hides the truth of Earth's death under a blanket of false purity. False purity? The white fluffy snow seems so innocent, but in actuality, it's the weapon that kills what lies beneath. He looks down at me, asking with slight humor, You always think this much? Sometimes. I do too. I stop and turn to face him and the wind kicks against us when I ask, What about? You, mostly. He drapes his arm around me, tucking me against his side as we look out over the water. With his eyes cast out, he says, I've always had a lost soul. We don't look at each other as we speak, my arm now slung around his waist. Me too. Sometimes when I see a little girl with red hair, for a split second I feel hopeful that it's you but then I realized that you wouldn't be that little girl anymore. I used to sneak out of windows in the middle of the night when I went into foster care. You told me about Carnegie the last day we were together. I used to think that if I walked far enough to find a forest, you'd be there. 
My tears blend with the mist that collects on my face and trickles down my cheeks as we speak. He turns to me, his hands running down my arms, and his eyes fill with years of inconsolable pain that I know too well. I am so sorry, princess. I have so many regrets in my life, but none bigger than losing you. I see his tears, too. I was careless. No, Dad. I was. I should have never gotten involved with the people I worked for. I look into my father's reddened eyes as blades nick my heartstrings. I will never be able to make up for all my wrongs, for leaving you fatherless, for causing you so much heartache. He chokes out in shame. I don't blame you, Dad. You should. But I don't, I tell him, and he pulls me into his loving arms that I've craved since I was five years old. All I ever wanted was this, you holding me. I've needed your arms so badly, I say, the words wrapping around my throat, making it hard to speak. I need you to listen to me, he says insistently, and I look up at him. I need you to know how much I love you. I need you to know that without you, my heart is incapable of ever being complete. You, you are the very fibers of my being. I rest my head against his chest and listen to his heartbeat as he continues. I remember the day you were born. The nurse placed you in my arms, and I was forever changed. You softened my heart instantly, and I knew I would never be the same. I've never been so in love like I've been with you. I need you to never forget that. I won't. Let me look at you, he requests when he takes my face and cranes it up to him. He shakes his head, saying, I just can't believe how beautiful you are. My baby, you're all grown up. Reaching my hand up, I run it along his jaw where his beard used to be. I can't believe I found you. You did. And I will forever be thankful for that. To see you, and to know you're okay. He leans down, pushes the hood of my raincoat back, and kisses the top of my head. His back shudders against my hands in sadness as he continues to plant kisses in my hair. You and I, he eventually says, we're unbreakable even when we've been broken. I've never let you die, even when I believed you were dead. We stand here, together in the misty rain, and we're tear-stained souls who finally united when the world has kept us apart for so long. I can't believe I have you back. I weep. He wipes my face with his hands. No more tears, okay? I nod and inhale deeply to soothe myself. When he turns his head to look up where our cars are parked, he says, That man up there. He's a good one. I watch Declan, who's talking on the phone, and smile. He's really good to me, Dad. I don't deserve him. You do. You deserve each other. I see how he looks at you, as if it's the last time he'll ever look at you. He moves to stand in front of my view of Declan. That's the look of a man who's desperately in love, he says. Even though I love you in a very different way, it's the same way I look at you. His words comfort in ways I can't explain, and I smile up at him. There's that gorgeous light, he adulates, and then kisses my forehead. I love your smile. I love you, Dad, so much. I love you too, Princess. When he looks at his watch, he groans. I've got to run. He takes my hand and leads me back up to the car, and when he opens my door, he leans down and looks to Declan, giving him a nod. Declan returns the gesture without any words spoken. Thanks, Dad, I tell him. I needed this. I did too, sweetheart. He leans in and kisses my cheek and I kiss his before he runs his hand down the length of my face. Drive safe, okay? You too. I will never love anyone the way I love you, he tells me before he closes my door. Declan then takes my hand and pulls it into his lap after we pull out of the parking lot and start heading back to the hotel. I reflect on the words my dad said to me, words I've been longing to hear, to know that I was never disposed of. To know that he's hurt for me like I've hurt for him dissolves all resentment. And he's right. Even when we were apart, we were still together as one, because neither of us let the other fade from our souls. 
no one can break us. Walking through the door of our hotel room, a wave of unease hits me out of the blue. We forgot to make plans to see each other again. Declan, did my dad say when he was coming back? He shrugs his jacket off and tosses it over a chair, saying, No. I watch Declan as he moves aimlessly around the suite as worryment nags me. Declan? Yeah, he calls out when he wanders into the bedroom, and I follow him. Something doesn't feel right. What do you mean? He's never not said when he'd be coming back. Maybe he just forgot. No, this doesn't feel right to me. He runs his hands down my arms and scoops my hands up in his. Darling. Declan, something is wrong here, and I don't trust it, I say as a surge of fear takes over me. My hands start shaking. Can you drive me by his house? Why? I don't know, but my gut is telling me that something is happening here that I don't know about, I tell him in a tremoring voice, panging in terror. I don't think that's a good idea. Either you take me or I'll go on my own. You can't stop me and you know it. Elizabeth, no. Why are you fighting me on this? I just don't think it's safe, he says, and I plead. You promised me you would bend. I need you to bend. He releases a deep breath. Okay. Declan grabs the keys, and I rush out the door. He drives with a white-knuckled grip on the steering wheel. Why are you so tense? He doesn't speak, only reaches over to hold my hand which does nothing for my anxiety. I stare at him as we pull into the neighborhood, and there's a look in his eyes I've never seen before. My stomach holds the weight of a thousand pounds, and I want to scream at the top of my lungs to drive faster. The moment he pulls onto Fairview, I see the sign. I never knew the twist of fate that day held for me, but when I look back, I should have known. It was too much, too much freedom. The words were too strong. The feelings were too intense. The truth was all around me, but I was too consumed with my dream come true to realize the evil nemesis that couldn't just let me be. If I would have paid better attention, I would have said more to him. I would have made sure he knew every beat of my heart, the depths in which I've always loved him, and how utterly perfect I've always thought he was. He was selfish, though, and I can't blame him. Because looking back, I know he wanted to see my smile, pure and true, for one last time. There's no way I could have given him that if I knew what was coming. I sling open the door before Declan stops the car and run up to the now vacant house. In an utter panic, I yank on the front door, and when that doesn't budge, I peer into the windows. My heart snaps loose inside of my chest and falls into the depths of fiery hell. Once again, I'm faced with the stench of tragedy. Where is he? I scream out as Declan walks up the circle drive. Where is he? Baby, please. He reaches for me, but it isn't his touch I want, so I slap his hand away, seething. Don't fucking touch me. He reeks of guilt. Tell me where he is. He stares at me with pity. He's gone. Where? Let's get back in the car. No. I can't move. I can't breathe. All I can do is stand here, a bleeding mess as every part of what makes me human blisters in monumental agony. They grow, filling with the acid of heartache, only to pop and sear me from the inside out. You knew, I accuse bitterly, my hands fisting at my sides. You knew, didn't you? Yes. You unimaginable bastard, I shriek, slapping him across the face, and he takes it. I slap him again and then hammer my fists against his chest, causing him to stumble back. He doesn't fight me as I yell at him through my tears. How could you? Another searing slap. Are you done hitting me? No, I spit out as I ram my palm into his shoulder, and that's when he grabs a hold of my wrist. How could you not tell me? He jerks my wrist, forcing me into his arms, but I don't want his embrace. I want my dad. I fight against his hold, but he dominates my strength and forces me back down the driveway and into the car. Shock riddles my system as I stare at the for sale sign in the front yard. Declan gets into the car and speaks in an even and controlled tone. I am so sorry, baby. 
The salt of my pain eats away at my flesh when I turn to face him. I need answers. He got caught, he confesses. No, he didn't, I cry, unwilling to believe him. They allowed him to have this one last day with you while they emptied the house. No. He's gone. No! And it was in that moment the world fell from its axis and tumbled into nothingness. I only existed in a realm of blank space. I don't know what happened next. I don't remember the drive back to the hotel. I don't remember going to bed. Nothing existed that night. I suppose the pain must have been so incredibly excruciating that I couldn't tolerate it, and all my senses seized. Maybe it was something greater that was sparing me of having to carry that memory around with me for a lifetime. Whatever it was that saved me from the horror of that night. Thank you. Chapter 27 I sit in my car with my gun and watch Archer and his daughter on the beach. I'm far enough away from their cars so they don't take notice of me, but my eyes never leave them. I've been anxious ever since I got the phone call on their new whereabouts, and that anxiety is at an all-time high now that I'm here. When someone does you wrong, it doesn't simply disappear. It festers and marinates, growing like wildfire. I think of my brother, who lost his freedom. He's been sitting in prison for over a decade. His wife lost her husband. His children lost their father. My parents lost their son. It's a ripple of destruction, and Archer will pay for all that he's destroyed. But this isn't my payback. It's my brother's. As this little family reunion wraps up, I go ahead and pull my car out and wait down the street for Steve's car to pass. It doesn't take long for him to leave, and I cautiously trail behind him. Once we make it over to Gig Harbor, the traffic thins out. Winding through the heavily wooded back streets, it's go time. I hammer my foot on the accelerator and swerve across the double lines. When my car evens up to his, I jerk the wheel and run him off the road into a ditch. In rapid-fire movements, I'm over to his car with my gun aimed on him. Open the fucking door! He does, begging. Take whatever you want, but please. No talking! I shove the muzzle to his forehead as he looks at me in horror. This is vengeance for my brother. You ratted Carlos Montego out to the feds, and now he's spending the rest of his life behind bars. His eyes flinch when I mention my brother's name. He told me to kill you, but I'm going to give you a choice, I tell him, fucking with him, because no matter what he says, he's dying. I know your daughter is here, and staying at the Pearl's Edge. No, please don't. Choose. You die, or she dies. You have five seconds. I pull the slide back and chamber around when he pleads urgently. Kill me. Don't hurt my- I fire two shots into his head, and he falls lifelessly to the ground, maroon blood oozing out of him. Quickly holstering my gun, I look around, but there's still not a car in sight. I grab him under his arms and drag his body out into the woods. The adrenaline pumping through my veins helps me move at a velocious rate. Tossing this fucker behind a pile of brush, I run back to my car and hightail it out of there with the thrill of vengeance roiling through me. It's finished. Chapter 28 Rain falls against the window, its particles alone and bleak, waiting to be joined by other raindrops. And once mended, they fall, trickling their way down the glass. I lie in bed on my side and watch this endless pattern repeat itself again and again. I've been up for a while, I don't know how long, but long enough to notice the storm intensifying every few minutes or so. The somber clouds hang like a veil, cloaked in the darkness of dysphoria. I know the sun is out there somewhere, far, far away. She refuses to shine her light on me, but that's okay. I don't want it anyway. I'd rather drown in my misery than be ridiculed by resplendent radiance. The weight of Declan's arm as he drapes it over my hip alerts me to his rousing. A part of me is angry that he knew and didn't tell me that yesterday would be the last time I saw my dad. 
But at the same time, I need him close, and for there to be no animosity between us. He continues to prove to be the one man I can count on. He's all I have left, again. I roll onto my back, snug up against him, and watch him watching me. I'm sorry, I rasp against the strain of my throat, an attestation of how much I probably screamed and cried last night. You slap hard. His lips tick in a subtle grin, and then he shifts, saying more seriously, Don't you ever be sorry for how you feel. It's okay. I don't say anything else, exchanging words for reticence. I close my eyes and seek solitude in the warmth of Declan's body. We remain in bed for most of the morning, drifting in and out of sleep, because sleep is much more appealing than having to face the truth. Reality can go fuck itself for all I care. I'd rather frolic among the fantasy of dreams. Eventually, Declan decides it's time to wake. I remain under the sheets as he calls up for coffee and tea. He then goes into my toiletry bag and finds my prescription bottle. I take the pill he hands me, and again, cheek it. Once he's in the bathroom and I hear the faucet running, I drop the pill behind the headboard. He'll be furious if he ever finds out. He won't. Pike stands and leans against the fog-covered window, looking out at the storm. Everything they told me about my dad was a lie, you know? I whisper, keeping my voice low so Declan won't hear. Pike walks over to me, kneels beside the bed, and holds my hand. I know. He was everything I thought he would be after all these years. Are you hungry at all? Declan asks when he walks back into the room, and suddenly Pike is gone. I shake my head when I look at him from over my shoulder, and then turn back to the window. Declan encourages me to get out of bed and freshen up, and like a machine, I do it, all the while numb. Did last night really happen, or was it a mirage? When I slip back into bed and sit against the headboard, Declan hands me the teacup. I cradle it in my hands as the steam ribbons into the air, eventually evaporating in a metaphoric display. Declan sits next to me with his coffee in hand. He takes a sip and then punctures the silence. Talk to me. I keep my eyes on my tea. What's there to say? Tell me how you're feeling. I don't know how to feel right now, I respond despondently. Do you want to know how I feel? When I look at him, his face is marred in suffering. I feel like I failed you. His words weigh heavy in the air between us. I promised you I'd never let you fall. And when your father pulled me aside and told me it was his last day with you, I knew the best thing for you would result in you falling in the worst way possible. He sets his coffee mug on the bedside table and then turns to me. I was powerless to save you, and it kills me to know I couldn't protect you from this pain. I was put in the worst possession last night, and I am so sorry. Declan isn't a man who ever apologizes, so to hear the sincerity in it is a blatant reflection of his grief. I want to say something, tell him I understand, tell him it's okay, but it hurts too much to speak. He leans over and opens the drawer to the bedside table, pulls out an envelope, and hands it to me. Your dad gave this to me yesterday. I hold it in my hands for a moment before breaking the seal and opening it. His written words cover the paper entirely, and agony conquers numbness and takes over. I don't know if I can do this, Declan. It might help, he suggests. Taking a deep breath, I release it slowly before lowering my eyes to his words. Declan wraps his arms around my shoulders and holds me against him when I start reading the letter to myself. My beautiful girl, I know you must be hurting, because I'm dying inside. I wish I could be there to comfort you and wipe your tears but I also know that you're in good hands with Declan. I don't want you to be upset with him. I told him not to tell you I'd be leaving. If I told you, I knew I'd never be able to leave you. I couldn't have our last day together with you in tears. I hope you can understand that. The thing is, the government found out that you and I had made contact. They stepped in, and as much as I hate it, I have to agree with them. Your association with me puts you at an unbelievable risk. 
and if anything happened to you, I'd never be able to live with myself. You are too precious for me to put you in harm's way. Selfishly, I want you, but because of the mistakes I made in my past, this is how it has to be. I don't know where I'm relocating or what my new identity will be, but I need you to let me go. Please don't try to find me. I don't say this because I don't love you. I'm saying it to save you. After you read this letter, I need you to destroy it because no one can ever know that I'm alive. These past few days were a gift. It was never supposed to happen, but it did. And I will forever be thankful that I have a daughter that fought her way to find me. You are strong and beautiful and smart, and you are destined to do great things. Promise me, you won't let my mistakes stand in your way. I don't want you to ever forget how much I love you. There hasn't been a single second that you haven't been in my heart. You are irreplaceable and unforgettable. I need you to believe that. I'm going to take you to the beach tomorrow. I'm going to hold your hand. I'm going to make you smile. And whatever I wind up saying to you, I need you to hold on tightly to those words and carry them with you through your life. You are my forever princess. I love you. Dad. I drop the paper that's covered in my tears and fall against Declan. He envelops me and I sob. There's nothing for me to say, so I let pain devour me. It strangulates and paralyzes, cutting fresh wounds in my soul, marking me with this pain for life. I want to drown in it. I want to escape from it. I'm all over the place. The vacancy inside of me is about to surpass my body's elasticity, and I grow desperate to fill the void I fear will be the death of me. I cling to Declan, slinging my leg over his hip and pulling him against me as we slip down in the bed. Drawing my head back, I look through my tears at his blurred face. Breathe. His hushed voice lulls, and while he wipes the tears that continue to fall, I give myself the time I need to settle myself down. The pounding of my heart transitions into neediness. I pull Declan's head to mine and kiss him. He lets me control it, and I keep it soft and move slow. My lips meld with his, and he brings my body in even closer. I feel a few lingering tears as they slip out and fall down the sides of my face and into my hair. He rolls on top of me, parting my lips with his tongue and dipping it into my mouth. With my hands getting lost in his hair, I pull him down on me, needing to feel his weight on top of me. We continue to kiss in this new way. There's no urgency or need for control. Declan drags his lips from mine and runs them down my neck before he breaks the kiss and looks down at me. I gaze up at him, desperate for this closeness, and make my request. Show me how tender you can be. I know I'm asking a lot. Declan isn't one who feels safe when he opens himself up to vulnerability, but I need this. For this moment, I need him to love me in this way, stripped down and free from the barriers he likes to keep on me. I watch as his eyes soften, and when he gives me a nod, he drops his lips back down to mine. My hands roam freely, something he never allows because I'm always restrained. I slip them under his shirt and feel his abs flex from my touch. We undress each other slowly, and soon our clothes are on the floor. Flesh against flesh, his skin heats mine. He keeps his touches soft, taking my breasts in his hands. His breath ghosts over them and over my puckered nipples before taking one of them between his lips. He sucks lovingly, and the sensation causes my back to bow off the bed and into him. My eyes fall shut, and with my hands running along the dips of his muscular arms, I release a breathy moan. He moves to my other nipple, showing it the same affection before dragging his hot tongue down my stomach. When he reaches the curve of my pussy, he puts his hands on each thigh and spreads my legs. God, I love this part of you, he whispers in a husky voice. I move my eyes down to him and watch as he stares at my pussy. I reach both of my hands down to him, and he takes them in his, lacing his fingers through mine. And before he makes his move, he lifts his eyes and fixes them to mine. 
We watch each other as he holds my hands and dips his tongue into the slit of my pussy. He sends a sizzling current through my whole body. He moves painfully slow. I spread my legs wider as he laps and kisses and sucks, every movement softer than the one before. He groans from deep inside his chest, and when his tongue slides inside of my body, I can't hold on. I mule in pure ecstasy and grind myself over his face, clutching my fingers around his hands. I grow hotter as he sparks the live wire in my soul, the one that incessantly aches for him. He moves his lips to my thighs, dropping whispery kisses over every inch of my skin as he lets go of my one hand and drags the wet arousal out from inside of me with his finger and uses it to rub my clit. Our bodies move together, and we're unrushed, unmasked, and completely exposed. When he finds his way back up to me, I hold his face in mine and kiss him deeply, fusing my lips with his as I glide my tongue along his. He settles himself between my legs, his hard cock pressing against me. I want it real slow, I tell him. How slow, baby? So slow I can feel you entering my soul. He reaches down and holds himself in his hand. Never has the sensation been more intense than in this very moment as he pushes inside me. It's exquisite. It's torturous. It's effervescent bliss. And when he's fully immersed in me, I'm saved. Free from my cankering misery, I hold on to Declan as he fucks me in slow, agonizing strokes. His moans blend with mine, our bodies coalesced like never before. Our souls tethered into one. He flips us over, and I roll my hips over his cock. He sits up and kisses my neck, my tits, my mouth, while I fist my hands in his hair and rock into him. When he leans his head back, I stare into his eye as I ride his cock. I love you, my words resting on broken pants. He groans through rictus lips before reaching his hands around the backs of my shoulders and pushing me farther down on his cock. I can feel him throbbing inside of me, and then he lifts me off him. Lying on my side with him behind me, he pulls my leg up and buries himself deep inside of me. He slips his one arm under my head, and I hold his hand while he uses his other to turn my head to him. We kiss, and I reach down between my legs to feel his cock as he fucks me. Touch yourself. Taking my wetness from his dick, I move to rub my clit in slow circles, and my hips buck when I do. He drapes my hair behind my shoulder and kisses the veins on my neck, sending my body into shivers. It doesn't take long before my pussy grows wetter and the onslaught of an orgasm begins to build inside of me. Declan shifts to his back with me on top of him, my legs bent and feet planted on the bed, and he thrusts into me from behind. My back lies against his chest, and he's now massaging my clit alongside my fingers. Our hands grow wet as he continues sliding himself in and out of me. Oh God, Declan. That's it, baby. I want to feel you all over me. With my hand locked to his, I rock my hips down on him, unable to still myself and greedy for him to fill me with his cum. Fuck me, I tell him, and with our fingers mingled in my pussy, he pumps his hips up into me. My eyes fall shut as my ass slides back and forth over the top of him. Nerves begin to fissure, limbs begin to tingle, he presses his fingers down on my clit, and I rupture. He pounds his thick cock into me, driving my orgasm out of me. I writhe against him, pulling every bit of pleasure he has to give, and then I feel him come. He groans heavily, spurting his life source inside of my body, grabbing my pussy with his hand and grinding me roughly against him. We ride each other, taking every piece from one another that we can, my head slips off the back of his shoulder, and he kisses me deeply, our tongues tasting and licking. When he rolls us back to our sides, he pulls himself out of me, cum dripping onto my thighs as I turn over to face him. He plants his lips on my sweaty forehead. Thank you. I love you, he tells me. 
If this is what you need, I'll give it to you as many times as you need it. We stay in bed for most of the day, naked and wrapped in each other's arms. If I'm not sleeping, then I'm crying. If I'm not crying, then we're kissing and touching. And if we're not kissing and touching, then I'm sleeping. The cycle laps as the hours pass. Eventually, Declan takes a shower, leaving me alone with the rain that has yet to let up. With the blankets tucked around me, I feel at peace here in the hotel room with Declan and away from anything that could have the potential to hurt me. A buzzing sound alerts me. I sit up and look around the room, unsure of what the noise is. Then, when I spot my purse on the floor next to the closet, it hits me. I slip out of the bed and dig my hand down past my wallet and grab my cell phone. Unknown reads across the screen. I accept the call. Hello? Hey, Kitty. Chapter 29 I thought I told you not to call me. My voice is razor sharp, but I keep it low because Declan is in the shower. I wouldn't call you if I weren't desperate. I need your help, so it's time you got off your high horse and remember where you came from and the people that took care of you. As I kneel by the wall next to the closet, I respond, took care of me? Who helped Pike save you from your foster parents? Who drove the car? Who let you live with them? Let's get one thing straight. You were Pike's friend, not mine. Are you going to help me or not? Not. Like I said, you die and I have the guarantee that I can move forward without having to look over my shoulder. You're gonna die too, he says, his words catching me off guard. What are you talking about? It was the only way to ensure I stay alive. What the hell are you talking about? I grit as I stand. You think you're running this show? Think again. You might not value my life, but I'm not willing to lose it over an uptight cunt like you. I try to keep my voice from quivering. What did you do? I gave them your name, told them you had the money, so you have no choice but to help me. After all... Your life is on the line, too, now. The shock and fury that surge through my veins is rampant fuel, and I'm not even thinking about keeping a hushed tone when I spit my fury. You motherfucker! He laughs, saying, Next time don't fuck with me when I ask for help, Kitty. I start when the bathroom door busts open and Declan rushes out with only a towel slung around his waist. Are you okay? His words shoot out quickly. Who's on the phone? He doesn't wait for me to respond when he takes it right out of my hand. Who the fuck is this? He pauses and then holds the phone out and clicks it onto speakerphone. Can she hear me? Matt questions. She can hear you. They know you're in Washington. As soon as he says those words, I reach over and end the call. What the fuck is going on, Elizabeth? Declan ferociously demands. I tell him about Matt, about his calling me when we were back in London and about the loan shark. And then I tell him that Matt traded me in to save his life. There's a bounty on my head now. Rage takes over Declan in a deadly way that scares the shit out of me. He stands in utter silence as he bores his eyes down on me, and when his nostrils flare angrily, he fumes in an even tone. Why didn't you tell me about this sooner? I thought I handled it. I thought it was under control. You thought wrong, goddammit and now you have a hit out on you. His voice ricochets off the walls, his neck blotching the color red in white-hot anger. I'll just pay them off, Declan. You think that'll solve this Matt situation? The ease at which he was able to dispose of your life is not something to fuck with. And what happens when he finds himself in trouble down the road? You really trust him when he says he's going to leave you alone after this? Declan rips his hand through his wet hair and paces off across the room. I watch as frustration and fiery anger boil over, and I'm quick to make my resolve. I'll kill him, I say, too fast and too eager. Declan snaps his head over to me with a look of horror on his face. Maybe I should be worried about how he'll respond or how he'll think of me to know I can rid someone of their life so easily, but I'm not. Declan knows I have three kills under my belt. Hell, he has two himself. He knows the tar my black heart pumps. And when he speaks, 
I know we're one and the same, two monsters bound by one soul. No, he states. I'll kill him. Declan, no. I can't let you do that. Matt's my problem. He strides over to me in quick steps. I won't let you kill anyone else, you hear me? I don't want your hands branded by any more blood. I'll take care of it. Declan, I'm not arguing with you about this. My word is final, he states adamantly. Pack your suitcase. They know where we are, so we're getting the fuck out of here. Are we going back to Chicago? Yes. We're taking care of this issue now, and then going back to London, he says. But listen to me. Bennett's money. We're dumping it on the loan shark. Not only will we finally be rid of it, but it'll be enough to make these people forget you ever existed. Taking a hard swallow, I know this is ultimately the best resolution for us. And now, once again, I'm plagued by my past, which is now forcing the man I love to take another life. Declan's able to schedule the plane to go out today, and with the vicissitude we now face, there's no time for me to mourn the loss of my dad. We move with urgency, making sure our belongings are packed and ready to go before we head out. We sit hand in hand during the plane ride. Declan, you don't have to do this. It's not up for discussion. The plane lands, and we drive straight back to Lotus. Every step Declan takes is purposeful, wasting not a second. Tension is ghastly as I watch Declan take out the pistol he always travels with. He releases the cylinder and gives it a look before spinning it and locking it back in place. Declan? Laying it flat on the table in front of where I sit on the couch, he looks down at me. You're going to call him from your phone. It's an unknown number he's calling from. There's an identification service I had Lachlan install on your phone. It traps the numbers from any restricted calls your phone receives. I pull out my phone so Declan can show me where to retrieve the number, and with a few simple clicks, it pops up. What do I say? You tell him you're here in Chicago and want to get this over with tonight. It's after 2 a.m., and my heart rate picks up. It's the middle of the night. Disregarding my hesitation, he goes on to instruct me on everything I need to say. You got all that? Taking a deep breath, knowing what's about to go down, I steel myself for the inevitable as I dial Matt's number. Hello, Matt says after two rings. It's me. How'd you get this number? Everyone is traceable. Even you, asshole, I tell him, slinging his words back at him from when he first made contact with me. I'm here in Chicago. You move fast. You want to live, don't you? Yes. I'm here to save your life, so I need you to do this my way. I'm firm in my tone, and a tad shocked when he keeps his mouth shut and listens. I don't want any fuck-ups or you getting greedy on me. We're meeting tonight. You're to call the shark to meet us. I'll make the transfer from my phone and wait until we get the verification from the shark's account that the money has been successfully transferred. Come alone. The last thing I need is your boyfriend fucking shit up because he can't keep his cool. Don't worry, I'll be alone, I lie. You have ten minutes to call me back to tell me the location of our meeting place. I hang up before he can respond and look to Declan. He smiles. Good girl. He takes a seat next to me as we wait in the darkened room, the only light coming from the glow of a lamp on the entryway table. Declan drapes his arm around my shoulder, and when I turn my head to him, he peers at me through dilated eyes, exposing the devil inside. He's the creation of my monstrosity. I touch his face, and he kisses me with venomous passion before ripping away from me when my cell vibrates against the wooden table. Yes, I answer. Twenty minutes. Metro Railroad Yard. Meet under the Roosevelt Overpass. How many are coming? Just me and Marco, the shark. Twenty minutes. I disconnect the call and tell Declan where we're meeting. He grabs his gun and then goes to the entry closet where the safe is. I can hear the beeps of the keypad as he enters the code, and when the steel door slams shut, he returns with another revolver. Just in case he says when he hands me the gun. It's heavy and cold in my hand, and when I release the cylinder, I see that every chamber is loaded. 
You know the plan? I nod. Tell me. I know the plan. You're not to draw your gun unless absolutely necessary, okay? Blood swims rapidly through my body, and when I slip the gun into the back waistband of my pants, I lower my top and shrug my coat on to conceal it. Ready? Yes, I tell him, and then walk into his arms for comfort and strength. He holds me, kisses the top of my head, and assures, We stick to the plan, and then it'll all be over, and we can go back home, okay? Let's get this over with. Declan goes first, leaving me behind until I get his call. I wait anxiously as he goes to switch off the security cameras. After a few minutes of pacing the room, my phone rings. I'm in my office, he states. I move quickly, making my way down to him, and we exit the building through the back corridors that lead into the parking garage. Before I know it, we're zipping through the streets of Chicago on our way to the river. The drive is tense. No words are spoken at all. We both know our parts and what we have to do. Turning into the train yard, Declan hits the lights. Everything goes black as we weave through lines of train cars. When we edge closer to the water, I spot Matt with a tall man, thick with bulky muscles. That's him, I whisper. Declan stops the car and shuts it off. You ready? Our eyes lock. Yes. The moment Declan opens his door, Matt draws his gun and fires. It's a botched shot, but sends me into instant defense mode. Without sparing a second, all guns are drawn in an outburst of chaos. What the fuck, Elizabeth? Matt shouts, but my focus is on the automatic Marco has aimed at me, while Declan claims Matt as his target. So many words are being thrown around at the same time as sparks of fear ignite within me. On your fucking knees, Declan yells. Fuck you, Matt throws back. It's a frenzy all around me, but my only point of concentration is right in front of me, Marco and his gun. Elizabeth. Declan's voice calls from behind in worryment, to which I respond in a steady voice, I'm okay. What the fuck is wrong with you? The shark snaps at Matt, berating him as he keeps his gun pointed at me. Marco, I greet in a strong voice, needing him to see me as nothing other than a woman in complete control. He stands a good one foot taller than me, and the moon reflects off his shiny bald head. He's intimidating as hell, but I refuse to let it show. I'm not looking to bullshit around tonight. The fact that my pistol is on you is a mere result of your client firing his gun. Clearly, he's as dumb as he looks because without us, you don't get your money, and he's a dead man. With Marco's gun targeted on me, I instruct, You need money from this asswipe, and I intend on covering his part along with enough to make you forget this night ever happened. But I'm going to need you to holster your gun. You do that and mine is down as well. But you need to get that little shit under control, too. You're my kind of girl. Elizabeth, right? It's whatever you want it to be. I'm not here to make friends. I like you, he says before taking his aim off me and swinging his arm around to Matt. You're a fucking idiot, he scolds, and then pulls the trigger, sending a bullet straight into Matt's leg, collapsing him down to the ground in an instant. Marco doesn't bat an eye when he holsters his gun and turns back to me, while Matt screams in agony. I watch as Declan picks up Matt's gun, before I look back to Marco and shove my pistol into the waist of my pants. I give you my word that we have no intention of doing you any wrong. That man right there, I tell him, nodding my head to Declan. He's not too happy that your client has put me in harm's way. So, let me tell you how this night is going to go. You give me the account number you want me to wire the money into. I suggest it be whatever offshore account you no doubt hold, because I intend on dumping a lot of fucking cash into it. Then we wait. When the money is transferred, my friend holding the gun is going to teach Matt a lesson. You're more than welcome to watch, but I'll leave that choice to you. Then I plan on going home and getting some sleep. My orders are to the point. You're good, he compliments. I've dabbled in enough cons for one life. Elizabeth, Matt's voice is terror-stricken. What the fuck is going on here? Shut the fuck up, dickfuck, Declan shouts, 
and when I look at Matt over my shoulder, I tell him with a smile, Who's the cunt now? Please, man, don't kill me. Declan steps closer and presses the muzzle of the gun against Matt's forehead. I told you to shut the fuck up. Matt continues to flap his pathetic mouth, begging Declan to spare his life, but I turn back to Marco. Let's speed this up. I've had a long day. My phone is in my pocket, he tells me so I don't assume he's reaching for a weapon. I'll get it. I trust no one. I pull it out and hand it to him before retrieving my own phone. I wait as he pulls up the bank account he wants to use for the transfer. He proceeds to provide all the information that I need to conduct the wire, and once the country code and numbers are all entered, we wait for the delivery. It takes about fifteen minutes for Marco's bank account to update and reflect the deposit. Fuck me. His face grows in satisfaction when he sees the amount of zeros in the transaction. Are we done here? His eyes meet mine, and he shoves his phone back into his pocket. Done and forgotten. Marco, come on, man. Don't leave me here, Matt begs through the pain of his bloody leg. I'm not leaving. Not yet, anyways. Marco backs up, and when I turn over my shoulder to look at him, he straightens out his coat and says, Can't be getting my new coat dirty, with a wink. When I focus back on Matt, his eyes spiral out of control as he continues to plead. Come on, I swear to you, I'll leave you alone, Elizabeth. Don't shoot me. You threw my life away to keep yours, and now you're begging me to save you? You're unsavable, Matt. You always have been. It's me, Elizabeth. Come on. His body tremors in inexorable fear. It coats his face in a layer of sweat. The only thing I owe you before you die is a thank you. What the fuck? Thank you for handing me the match the night we burned Carl and Bobby. It's the best gift you ever gave me. You fucked up the moment you put her life in danger. Declan's voice is guttural, his eyes merciless. Don't do this, man. Please. Bang! Matt's blood sprays across the side of my face and clothes as the crack of gunfire echoes through the night. His body collapses as dark blood pours out of the hole in his head. Clumps of his brain litter the gravel surrounding us. Declan stands above his unmoving body, aims the gun down, and ensures his death. Bang! Bang! Behind the ringing in my ears, I hear Marco's distant voice. That's gonna be a bitch to clean up. Followed by stones crunching under his feet and the slam of his car door. The tires of his SUV roll over the rocks of the train yard, and then he's gone. Declan remains fixed above Matt's dead body. He's a cold-blooded phoenix, no longer the man he once was when I met him in Chicago. He's the creation of my monstrosity forever changed as the result of my demented soul. He fell in love with the devil when he fell in love with me. When his eyes shift to me, I go to him, grab his blood-streaked face, and affirm, I love you, before kissing him through the metallic taste of death. Chapter 30 At least you got to see him. You always said you'd do anything to have him back for just one more second. You got that and more. It still hurts. I know. Pike tightens his arms around me as I lay my head on his chest. He's been with me ever since Declan left earlier to pay Lachlan a visit. I haven't been able to get out of bed since we returned to London yesterday. Everything came to a standstill when we boarded the plane in Chicago. All of a sudden, there were no more distractions and the weight of the past few days came crashing down on me. I'm sad. I miss my dad. He's alive, though. Is that supposed to be a good thing? His fingers comb through my hair while I grip a wad of his white shirt that embodies the scent of his clove cigarettes. What do you mean? I mean if his life is plagued with the agony he told me he carries with him every day. Wouldn't death be better? This world forces people to endure incredible pain. It's like we're all a bunch of masochists because we continue to choose life over death. That's a morbid thought. But it's true, right? I tilt my head back to look at his beautiful face, 
young and free from stress. Do you feel anything now that you're dead, he says, picking up the word that hurts too much to say. I miss you, but it doesn't feel like it did when I was alive. It's hard to describe. Somehow, I'm always at peace, even though I miss you. Missing you is excruciating. I wish I could take it away from you. But you have so much to live for. You have a life with Declan. He's good to you. He protects you. There are no boundaries for him when it comes to protecting you. He'll do anything. I move to sit up in bed, and when Pike does the same, we face each other. Are you mad about what we did to Matt? No. I agree with Declan. All bets were off the moment that fucker put your life on the line. I gaze into his eyes and release a deep breath before telling him, I don't know what I would ever do without you. His hand comes to meet my face, and I notice his eyes morph into a laden expression. Do you think I took advantage of you? What? He drops his head for a beat before returning to me, and he finally voices for the first time what I've always known. I was in love with you my whole life. His eyes glaze over, tear-filled, and he tells me, All I wanted was to make you happy. No matter what you asked of me, I gave it to you, even when I knew it was wrong. You didn't take advantage of me, Pike? I take his hand from my cheek and hold it in my own. It was me. I took advantage of you. I knew you were in love with me, and I used that to steal from you. I took your love, and I used it to comfort my pain, and I am so sorry I played with your emotions the way I did. Don't be sorry. He takes me into his arms, and as we hold each other, I ask, Do you still feel that way about me? No. Does it hurt you to see me with Declan? Relaxing his grip, he pulls away and runs his hands down my arms. No. He holds both of my hands and we sit face to face on the bed. I love you. I always will, and nothing will ever change that. But something happened when I died. The way I loved you changed. I know Declan is good for you. He's able to love you and care for you in a way I wouldn't have ever been capable of. Seeing you two together settles me. I know you're going to be okay in this life because of him. You and Declan are the best things that ever happened to me in this shitty life. And you are the best thing that ever happened to me when I was alive. And Declan is the best thing that's happened to me in my death. Because he's giving you everything I wanted to, but couldn't. You're the best part of me, you know. I look into the eyes of my Savior, and although I wish I could turn back the hands of time and not have pulled that trigger, at least I know he's moved on to a better place. And now, in his death, he goes on to serve as my orenda in this vicious world. He claims that it's only Declan who provides my safety and comfort, but it's the both of them together that blend the elixir that just might be my saving grace. Declan I hate that I had to leave Elizabeth back at the apartment, but I don't feel safe handling this situation with Lachlan around her. Between his calls to Camilla and the insinuations from my father that Lachlan is withholding information from me, trust is now riddled with uncertainty. I'm a sparking fuse dangling over gasoline as I make my way to his hotel. Hot off the kill from the other day, I've been unable to quell the viperous animal inside me. It's spitting at me to fix my own unresolved issue, the way I handled Elizabeth's for her. But I will go to any length possible to ensure Elizabeth's safety. I failed to protect her from Matt putting a hit on her. I won't fail again. With my pestle holstered under my suit jacket, I step off the elevator and make my way down to his room. After a couple swift knocks, the door opens, and I whip out my gun, barreling the muzzle into Lachlan's forehead. I use the force of the gun to push him into the room, and then kick the door closed. What the hell? His wide eyes are consumed with sheer horror and fear. I back him up as he lifts his hands in surrender and when he falls back into a chair, I hiss venomously. I'm going to give you one more chance to tell me what the fuck you are doing talking to Camilla and my father before I put a bullet in your head. You've seen me do it before, so make no mistake, I will do it again. 
What I told you was the truth. His words tremble just as his hands do. And now I'm demanding the whole truth. I bring my thumb up and engage the hammer, chambering around, and he gives in to the fear like a whore's pussy. Jesus, okay, okay. I'm not fucking around. Shit, okay, please relax with the gun, man. He blurts out in a panic. I'll tell you everything, just start talking. My bark is pure sulfur, and he's terrified as he squirms, slipping down into the chair. No. I'm stealing from Cal, he jabbers out instantly. What the fuck are you talking about? I'm, it's, the thing is, God damn it! I can't fucking think with a gun to my head, he hollers from his slouched position in the chair, and I draw the gun back, keeping it targeted on him. His eyes never stray from my weapon. I stand a few feet back and watch as he clumsily sets up. Start talking. Camilla called me when your father was arrested. When she realized the evidence was stacked against him, she knew she'd be left out to dry without a penny. She called me, told me her crazy scheme to embezzle his money. She had it all planned out, told me to reach out to him. She figured he'd be desperate to have someone in his corner, and aside from the fallout we had when I found out about the two of them, I was, in fact, a man he had thoroughly trusted for years. Speed it up. I reached out to him with the help of Camilla, and before I knew it, he was wanting me to keep an eye on you, which was when I started reporting to him about you, he confesses. You told him about Elizabeth? Yes. Get to the part that's going to save your life and spare me the headache of cleaning up your murder, I threaten. Camilla convinced him to trust me to launder his hidden assets through your charity foundation. She vowed we'd split it 50-50, but I had my own plans. I promise you, I never filtered any of that money through any of your businesses. Where is it? With a junket in Macau. I disengage the hammer and lower my pistol, and Lachlan drops his hands and releases a heavy breath of relief. I never lied when I assured you have my loyalty, you and Elizabeth, but never your father. And if that's an issue with us, then it's not an issue. He's done, I tell him, and then take a moment to process the fact that this man has taken it upon himself to undermine my father and his girlfriend for financial gain in the name of revenge. This is why Camilla keeps calling. I had to keep her believing that we were on the mend and working together, but I just got word the other day that he's been indicted. It's only a matter of time before he confesses. He knows he's safer in prison than out. If he allows this to go to trial, it won't matter if he wins or loses. He's a dead man. He's right. I know him admitting his guilt to forego a trial will be inevitable. A trial would mean witnesses and handing over names. It would be him turning his back on those only a man with a death wish would do. Which is why I refuse to allow Elizabeth to get worked up about her crimes being uncovered. I need you to go back. You said the money was with a junket, I ask. I'm not skilled in the world of embezzling, so I need you to tell me what's going on. No more bullshitting me. Working in the world of finance all my life, I've come to know a handful of shifty people. One of them was able to hire me a junket in China. For a 20% fee, he exchanges my cash for poker chips. With Macau being the casino capital of the world, and Hong Kong having so many intermediaries that are willing to transfer funds to anywhere without asking too many questions, it was my safest option. What happens with the chips? My junket gambles a little, and then cashes them in along with other gamblers' legitimate chips. The casino accountant then books my money as paid-out winnings. Where does the money go? The funds are wire-transferred in such a way that the money crosses multiple borders to frustrate detection. Explain, I demand, needing to know exactly how he plans on transferring what I assume to be millions. For instance, he continues. The money might end up in a U.S. trust managed by a shell company in Grand Cayman, owned by another trust in Guernsey with an account in Luxembourg, managed by a Swiss or Singaporean or Caribbean banker who doesn't know who the owner is. It's a whirlwind, basically. 
Were you ever going to tell me? He leans forward, resting his elbows on his knees, and then looks up to me. There's no way to answer that. If I say yes, you'll think I'm a liar. If I say no, you'll think I'm a liar for the mere fact I never told you. But if you need confirmation of where my interests lie, then I'll give you the accounts. You see, the money was simply a bonus to Camilla landing on her ass, dirt poor and alone. The latter was the capstone. Testing him, I click the barrel open and dump the bullets. I walk over to him, lay the gun on the desk, and tell him, I want all the accounts. Now? Now. He gets up and steps to his laptop next to my unloaded pistol. I follow, and when he sits in the desk chair, I stand over his shoulder. I watch as he bypasses the internet and accesses the deep web through Tor, which is an anonymity network that ensures nothing he does will be indexed. In a few quick swipes of the keyboard, numbers and codes begin to filter in. There you go, he says, and then points to the screen, explaining. This column lists the country codes. This one here lists account and routing numbers. And this column here is, close it down. He looks at me in confusion, but does as I instruct and proceeds to log off. I'm satisfied that without the threat of force, he handed over all the information without an inkling of hesitation. I don't want his money. You can do whatever you want with it. Lachlan closes the lid to his laptop, picks up the gun, takes one bullet from the floor, and slides it into one of the cylinders. He then gives it a spin before locking it into place. Here he says in an even tone as he hands me the gun. I'd take a bullet for Elizabeth. You, on the other hand. I need to come down from you shoving that muzzle into my head, but I'd take a bullet for you as well. You want me to prove my loyalty to you? He takes a couple steps back. Pull the trigger. A sane man would take his word for it, but the gesture isn't enough for me, not after everything that has compromised my life and Elizabeth's. She's much too precious to take anyone's word at face value. So I stretch my arm out in front of me, but with a slight adjustment, one that Lachlan won't be able to detect, I mark his right arm as my target. He offered this test of integrity, and when I cock back the hammer, I slip my finger over the trigger and follow through. I squeeze and fire, but all that sounds is the snick from the chamber rounding, Lachlan's face drops, stunned that I pulled the trigger, and then relieved when he realizes his game of Russian roulette just played out in his favor. He falls back into the chair as I holster my gun. And now that I have the confirmation that the only reason he withheld information from me was to fuck over Camilla and my father, I turn and walk to the door. Stop by later this afternoon. Elizabeth would enjoy seeing you now that we're back, I say without turning around. And then I leave. Chapter 31 Declan Elizabeth is still in bed sleeping when I get home from a long day of meetings. It's been days of the same. She's heartbroken and trying to cope with losing her father for the second time in her life. So I haven't wanted to push her too much. I'm worried, though. She's been living in shades of darkness since we returned from the States. It's more than the moping around that concerns me, though. After my talk with Lachlan the other day, I came home and heard her voice coming from the bedroom. But she was in there alone. When I opened the door, I could tell she had been crying, so I decided not to question her. I have to remind myself how fragile she still is. It wasn't that long ago when she completely broke down after she found out about her mother and had to be medicated. She has experienced only a handful of episodes since that night, but none that measure in magnitude. Walking over to the edge of the bed, I watch her as she sleeps peacefully. Her face is soft, and her breathing is steady. I run the backs of my fingers along her cheek, feeling her smooth skin warm against mine. I can finally look at her without the past fueling my hate for her. No longer do I want to cause her pain and suffering, no longer do I want to punish her. 
Seeing her with her father helped stitch the wounds she inflicted with her deceitful ways. For the first time, I saw through all the walls she spent her whole life building and into the very core of who she is. Watching her with him, hearing their stories, and learning about who she was as a little girl suddenly made her transparent, and I could finally see the purity and softness that shrouded beneath years that have hardened her. I let her sleep while I go into the closet to hang up my suit jacket, and when I go into the bathroom to splash my face with cold water, I realize I forgot to grab a hand towel. Turning off the faucet, I walk into the toilet room and pull a towel from the linen cabinet. That's when I look down and notice something sitting in the bottom of the toilet bowl. I flick the light on to find it's a tiny blue pill, half dissolved in the water. I go to her sink top and pick up her prescription bottle to confirm it's the same pill. She's been lying to me. I have to wonder why she'd flush the pill instead of taking it because she needs to be taking them every day. Going back in the bedroom, I sit on the edge of the bed where she's still sleeping. The dip of the mattress beneath me causes her to stir awake. Her eyes flutter open, and I handle her delicately. You've been sleeping long? She looks at the clock on the bedside table and responds, Not too long. How was your day? Busy. What about yours? She sighs when she sits up and leans back against the headboard. Same as the day before. Did you remember to take your pill today? Yes. She answers with a curious look on her face. Why? You know how important it is that you take them every day, don't you? Annoyance paints her eyes. Yes, Declan, I know. Why are you telling me this? Because I want you taking care of yourself. I am. Then tell me why your pill is in the bottom of the toilet. Her eyes tick, widening for a fleeting second, but I catch it. Do you want to explain to me why? Her throat constricts when she takes a hard swallow, and she shakes her head slowly. She's scared. How long have you been doing this? I can take care of myself. I don't need you parenting me. She snaps. I harden my voice, demanding, How long? I'm fine. I don't need them. How long, Elizabeth? She takes a deep breath, steadying herself to take me on when she admits, Since I got them. My teeth grit in an attempt to temper my anger, and when she notices my mood shift, she tries coaxing me. Declan, I'm fine. You're not fine. I am. I heard you talking to someone the other night, but nobody was here, I say, calling her out. What are you talking about? I stand and pace back a few steps as my irritation grows. You were in this room with the door closed. You were talking to someone. Who was it? And don't you dare feed me a lie. Her eyes dart to the corner of the room, and when I look over to the window where she's focusing, the truth hits me. Pike. I turn back and take a few steps towards her. What are you looking at? Her eyes, now rimming with tears, shift back to me. I need you to talk to me, I plead as I sit back down on the bed next to her. Is it your brother? Are you seeing him again? Elizabeth. Don't lie to him. I'm completely caught. He's going to run now that he knows I'm crazy and that I've been lying to him. Panic pangs through my body as Declan stares at me. Trust me, Elizabeth. Trust me enough to tell me. He scoops my hands into his, and I can see the worry pouring out of him. Is that who you're looking at? Is he here? I close my eyes, scared of what his reaction will be, but I can't hide from the truth he now knows. My hands tremble in his when I finally nod my head, yes. He's here. I nod again, and when I get the courage to open my eyes, I confess, I need him. Baby, he breathes, cupping my cheek with his one hand. You can't do this to yourself. It's not healthy, and I need you healthy. But he's my brother. He's dead. I blink, and the tears fall. I know that, but I still need him. Need me more. 
His words expose an insecurity I wasn't aware of. I look into his eyes, really look, and I see what I've never seen before, self-doubt. The green in his eyes brightens in vibrancy, the effect of unshed tears that threaten to fall. I do need you, I tell him. It's not enough. Don't you dare choose me over him. I turn back to Pike as Declan keeps his eyes on me. This has to end, Elizabeth. You have to start taking your pills. I need you well. I don't look at him when he says this. Instead, I stay focused on Pike as my tears fall. He's right. No. Pike walks over to me and crawls onto the bed, sitting on the other side of me, across from Declan. No, I repeat fervently as I feel the fibers of my soul shredding apart. You can't keep hanging on to me like this. But I need you. I can't let you do this to yourself anymore, Declan says, and when I look back to him, I cry. But I need him. And I need you. You have to let him go, he insists. You have to take your pills and get better. I turn to Pike again, and when I do, Declan adds on a severed voice, As much as you need him, I need you more. I don't want to lose you, Pike. It'll be okay. It's not okay. None of this is okay. It's time to let me go. His request burns pieces of my heart into ash. I can feel it, scorching hot and blistering inside me, and I can't seem to cry hard enough to temper the flames. How do I let go when I don't know a day of survival without him? Don't leave me, I sob frantically. Baby, this is killing me to see you like this, Declan says breaking by my side. Say goodbye to me, Elizabeth. My face crumples as the agony of losing my brother for good strangles my heart, paralyzing the ventricles. Tears force their way down my cheeks, cutting me like shards of ice. Don't leave me. You're the best sister anyone could ever have, and I was so lucky that you were mine. Don't you dare say your goodbyes, Pike. Look at Declan. Look at what we're doing to him. I turn to my other side and see Declan's head in his one hand, while his other is holding on to me, and he's crying. Oh my God, he's crying. Declan, please don't cry. I need you, he beseeches desperately. We can't continue this. I watch as tears fall down Declan's face, and it's a punch to my gut to see how much pain he's in. A man who never cracks is now crumbling before me, because of me. Every tear of his is a fissure in my breaking heart, cutting its way deeper into the delicate tissues. I can't do this to him. I love Pike. He's sacrificed himself again and again, my whole life, just to protect me, and no words exist to express how much he means to me. But now it's my turn to protect, and it's Declan that I need to take care of because I need him strong so he can care for me in return. As much as this kills me, I dig deep inside all my rotted wounds to grab on to the strength I need to say goodbye. I never would have survived this world without you, Pike. But you did survive, and you're going to be okay without me. I love you. I need you to promise me that you'll listen to Declan, that you'll start taking your pills and get yourself healthy. He's adamant and I give him my word through the strain of my throat. I promise. I watch as his solid form ghosts into opacity, and I cry harder. I love you. Pike! Opacity transfuses into a cloudiness. I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss you, too. Cloudiness disappears into nothingness, and when the lingering vapors of his scent fade away, I fall into Declan. He's gone, I wail amidst the trauma of freshly crenellated wounds that bleed inside me. I'm going to take care of you. I need you to believe in me. I do believe in you. It just hurts to let go of him. Look at me, he demands, and when I do, his face is streaked in tears shed. I love you to the point it hurts, but I relish the pain of it because it reminds me that what we have runs so deep within me. And I swear to you, 
I will never stop loving you. I wipe the trail of tears from his face. Tell me it hurts you to love me, too. Bracing my hands along his jaw to feel his stubble against my palms, I give him the purest part of me. There's nobody in this world I could possibly hurt for more. Pike helped me survive, but it's you who helps me live. I was never able to do that until you. And in the madness of heartache and profound love, Declan takes me as his, holding me, fucking me, healing me. Tears never stop falling from my swollen eyes as I open my heart and allow Declan the freedom to climb inside and take full ownership of all that I'm made of. I no longer know where I end and he begins as we cement the amorphous lines between us. We're serpents who feed off one another for soul survivorship. We're everything love is meant to be. Chapter 32 Tears crystallize into salts, salts flake into dust, and dust gets swept away into the endless sky. And in the end, we are left with a choice, swim or drown. The right choice is often the hardest. Drowning is so easy to do and takes no effort. You simply go weak and float deeper in the despair that consumes. But Pike wouldn't want that for me, and I need to fight for Declan. So I took my love's hand and started to kick, trusting that together I would find my way to the surface. That was two weeks ago, and today I feel hopeful. It was four days ago that I laughed for the first time since I said goodbye to my brother. A part of me thought I'd never laugh again, but I did. And oddly, it was Davina that pulled it out of me. Declan thought it would be good to have her over for dinner. He didn't tell her anything we had been dealing with, but she knew something was wrong when I walked into the living room a disheveled mess. One would think a guest would be somewhat reserved, but not Davina. She called me out, telling me I looked like shit. It wasn't just her crass honesty, it was the appalling look on her face and in her tone of voice which she somehow managed to deliver in a caring way. And I laughed. That was all it took. For a couple weeks, Declan has postponed all his meetings and has given Lachlan time off. Declan and I need this time for us to be together and to mend. I feel myself healing little by little. Declan has been showing me around the city. We've dined everywhere from the Tipperary to the Michelin-awarded La Gavroche, I fed the ducks at St. James Park, and Declan couldn't hold in his laughter when two geese started chasing after me. The next day, we opted for Hyde Park, where we were able to lay under the sun, wrapped in each other's arms. We kissed and talked for hours that afternoon. And then there was the London Eye. Despite my fear of heights and Ferris wheels, I threw caution to the wind and got on. Although I never got off the bench in the center of the glass capsule, Declan appreciated my effort. We've been desperate for this time together, and now that we have it, we want more. If you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? Declan asks as we lie in bed, bodies naked and sticky with the smell of our sex in the air. Back to Brunswick Hill? Of all places, you chose our home in Scotland. I love it there. Running his fingers lazily through my hair, he comments, you love it that much. With my head tucked under his chin, I nod and then kiss his nape as I drape my leg over his hip. Declan grabs my ass and pulls me closer to him, forcing my pussy to grind against his hardening cock. Eager for him to fill me again, I reach down, take him in my hand, and guide him inside of me. Fuck me, baby, he growls in need, and when he rolls onto his back, I reach my hands behind me to grab his thighs. Opening my body up to him even more in this position, I fuck him as his hands touch every part of me, caressing, squeezing, pinching. He drives me wild, making me come all over him, the whole time reaffirming my place in his world, in his heart. Let's go there, he says in a heavy breath as our hearts slow. Where? Your fairy tale castle. He gives me a sexy smirk, and I release a soft laugh when excitement swells at the thought of going back to Scotland. 
Something happens to me physically as we drive through the gates of Brunswick Hill. I can't fully explain it, but maybe this is what home feels like. It's just the two of us, hand in hand, and for the first time in a very long time, my heart doesn't feel so heavy. When we get to the top of the winding drive, I hop out of the car, drop my head back, take in a deep breath, and smile. What are you doing? Declan wraps his arms around my waist, pulling me in close, and with my lips still painted in joy, I tell him, It feels good to be back. This house is your home now. I've never had this before. I've never known home until right now, right here with you. It's a first for me too, darling, but I wouldn't want this with anyone but you. His lips land on mine, taking me in a claiming kiss as my hands get lost in his hair. I taste his happiness when he dips his tongue inside my mouth and glides it along mine. This foreign feeling that swirls inside me takes me over and laughter slips out. He doesn't stop dropping kisses on me, though, and it's only a matter of seconds when he begins to laugh, too. What's so funny? He mumbles against my mouth. I pull back and look up at him. I'm just happy. Declan walks back to the Mercedes and pops open the hatchback to the SUV to grab our luggage, and as he does, I turn to look at the large, tiered fountain. Declan, look! Amazed by the blooms, I walk over to the massive fountain and inhale the earthy scent. They've always bloomed in there, he tells me as I look in wonderment at all the lotus flowers. White mixed with every hue of pink, each one flawless despite the murky water they rose from. They glow as they bask in the sunshine. They're so beautiful. Come here, he says. I want to show you a part of the house you've never seen. We walk inside the double doors, and he drops our luggage in the foyer, taking my hand and leading me up the stairs all the way to the third floor and into his office. What are you doing? I question as he runs his hand along the wall. When he stops moving, he casts his eyes to me and, with a smile, gives the wall a push. Are you kidding me? I laugh in surprise when it's revealed that a portion of the wall is a hidden spring-loaded partition that opens up to a secret spiral staircase. Come on. I follow him up the narrow stairs, and when we reach the top, there's another door that he opens. My eyes widen in amazement when I step out onto the rooftop, exposing a panoramic view of all of Galashiel's. Declan reaches out for me, knowing my fear of heights, and walks me to the wall's edge. You see that river? He asks as he points out. Yes? That's the River Tweed. It divides Galashiels from Abbotsford. And you see that castle-like estate down there? Yes? That's Sir Walter Scott's home. The poet? Yes. That's no home. I note as I look at the majestic estate that's nestled down below from where Declan's estate sits perched high on this hill. That's a palace. He chuckles. It's a museum now. There's also a quaint restaurant that's known for their shortcakes in there. We walk the border of the rooftop, and I look down to the grounds below, admiring all the colorful blooms that are coming to life as the weather warms. The past couple months of spring have done wonders, exposing more pebbled creeks that stream down various hills. There are too many flowers to count, along with a few stone benches, some that rest under trees and some that are out in the open. From up here, I can see the grassy paths that lead from one garden nook to the next, to the next, and to the next. A part of me feels like I'm cheating myself of the wanderlust of exploring and getting lost in the maze down there. My very own wonderland. It's stunning, isn't it? It's breathtaking, I say, and then turn to face him, pressing my body against his with my arms wrapped around his waist. I never thought anything like this could exist in the world. I feel the same when I look at you. We stand here, on the rooftop of our own personal castle, and wrap ourselves around each other. Declan cradles my head to his chest as he plants kisses down on me. We hug. It's all we need to do in this moment of much-needed peace. And finally, I can breathe. 
The weight of the world's afflictions are becoming less and less suffocating as I continue to move along this path Declan is providing me. Of course, a part of me still aches for my dad and for my brother, but that's a sadness I'll have to brave for the rest of my life. There's simply no cure for heartbreaks that surpass unfathomable agony. Some wounds run so deep that there's no possibility of healing. But here, with Declan, I'm hoping one day the pain will become more tolerable. I was thinking about something on the plane ride here, Declan says, breaking the silence between us. We should go to the water lily. I smile when I think about Isla, staying with her when I was at my ultimate lowest, thinking Declan had died at the hands of Pike, was probably the best place I could have wound up. We had so many great conversations. And I realize now that I know so much about his grandmother, when he's never really spoken to her. Isla has a beautiful heart, I tell him. I miss her. Why do you think she never said anything to me? She has a photo of me in her room, and she knows who I am. I see the little boy lost deep within his eyes as I look at him. Maybe she was scared. Maybe she didn't know what to say. Maybe, he responds. How about we pay her a visit tomorrow? Let's take the rest of the day for us. He leans down and kisses me before saying, Take a walk with me. We head back down the hidden staircase and then down to the main floor of the house. Walking through the atrium, we make our way outside. Everything looks so different than it did when we left a couple months ago, I say, as we stroll aimlessly through the flowers. We make our way up a stone pathway that runs alongside the clinker grotto, and then wander along another grassy path, weaving through trees and stepping over a narrow, babbling brook. I look down at the house, and I laugh to myself when I see the huge gaps that still remain in the now-flowering bushes that rim around the exterior wall. What's so funny? I still can't believe you ripped out all the purple bushes, I tell him, and when he looks down to the house to see the gaps, he shrugs. My darling hates purple, he says nonchalantly, and continues to walk. Sit with me, he says when we find ourselves surrounded by bright yellow daffodils. I settle myself between Declan's legs and back against his chest as he sits behind me. We both look out among the flowers as I sink into his hold. Tell me you're happy, he says, and I answer honestly, I'm happy. You know, the first time I ever saw you, I knew I had to have you. I rest my head against him as I listen to him speak. I'd never felt that intensely about anyone before. I can still remember how beautiful you looked that night, in your navy silk dress and long red hair. I was beyond fascinated by you. And I remember you, not even wearing a bow tie to your own black tie affair, I tease. I know our start was fucked up, but I wouldn't change it, because without it, we wouldn't have this. I'll never forgive myself, though. I need you to know something. The seriousness in his tone makes me sit up and turn to face him. I need you to know that I've forgiven you, and that hate I used to feel towards you, it's no longer there. His words soothe, and when he begins to kaleidoscope, I blink him into clarity. But these tears don't hurt, they heal. He places his hands on my cheeks and kisses me again. You give yourself to me in a way no other woman could. And even if they could, I wouldn't want them to. I'm not perfect. You've even called me out on my flaws a few times. But you've never thrown them in my face with ridicule, he says with gratitude. And when I tell you that I need you, I mean it. I can't battle this world without you by my side. You're the bravest woman I know. I'm not. You are. My God, the life you've been dealt, everything you've had to endure— and here you still are, still fighting, still trying. Because of you, I tell him. Every breath is a choice, and I choose to keep taking them for you. I'm going to give you a long life filled with breaths then, he affirms before he takes my face in his hands and looks steadfastly into my eyes. I once told you that the truest part of a person is the ugliest. I remember that night. The ugliest parts of you are your darkest, 
and trust me when I tell you that I want to love all your darkest parts. He reaches into his pocket, and my heart beats a beat I've never felt before as he pulls out a ring. And I promise you that I will love all of your darkness, if you promise to love mine too. Declan, marry me. And that was the moment all my dreams came true. We sat there in the Garden of Daffodils as he held that ring, which embodied exactly what we were between his fingers, two people who harbored so much darkness. The cushion-cut diamond was brilliant, and so very black with intricate facets, encircled with tiny, sparkling white diamonds that also adorned the delicately thin platinum band. But it wasn't the ring. It was him. It was always him. The only one who was strong enough to love me for me. He took all my rot and all my scars and somehow made me feel like a true princess. My whole life I was waiting for someone to save me, and he did. I knew in that moment that I would never be unloved, I would never be abandoned, and I would never be left to fight the monsters alone. Yes. My eyes never leave his beautiful face as he slips the ring onto my finger, and once in place, I throw myself into his arms, knocking him back to the ground, and we kiss like no two people have ever kissed. I pour my soul into his mouth as his hands grip me tightly. We're so needy for closeness. But that closeness is severed the moment I hear the snick. I jump back and turn in an instant to find myself staring down the barrel of a pistol. You move, I shoot her, the man snarls to Declan. But I know Declan isn't armed right now. We're helpless. I'm frozen in place. I can't even feel my heart beating anymore. This is vengeance. Your father fucked with the wrong family the moment he handed my brother's name over to the feds sixteen years ago. But because I'm sadistic, I'm going to give you the choice. Either you die, or your father dies. You have five seconds. I turn to Declan, already knowing my choice as I mouth, I love you, through razor-sharp tears. Elizabeth, no. Don't hurt my dad. Kill me. Eliz- Bang! Epilogue I look up into the brilliant, rich blue sky. There isn't a cloud in sight as the sun shines down in rays of glittering warmth. I look around to find I'm surrounded by gigantic, lime-green canopies, but when I take a closer look, I realize they aren't canopies, but instead, blades of grass. Carnegie? My eyes dart down to reveal my bright pink accordion body. I'm back. Hello? I call out, wondering why I'm all alone, and when I hear a rustling in the distance, I call out again. Carnegie? Is that you? Elizabeth, he hollers back, but his accent isn't right. Elizabeth. No, it can't be. Declan? I scoot around to see a blue caterpillar emerge from behind a blade of grass. Elizabeth he exclaims in his unmistakable Scottish brogue as he inches over to me. What are you doing in my dream? Dream? His beady eyes drop in dread. What's wrong? Darling. What's going on? I question in fear. You died. Horror fires off inside me as I look at him. Then, then what are you doing here? Don't panic. Oh my God! We're together, Elizabeth. That's all that matters. If I'm dead, then... I am too, he tells me. He shot me right after he shot you. No! I cry out, and he's right here next to me, comforting. It's okay, darling. We're still together. Nothing can hurt us now. But you're... you're dead because of me. No, baby. You made the right choice. That guy was there for revenge. And no matter what you said, he would have killed us anyway, he tells me. But look around you. This place is incredible. I stare at him in utter shock and ask, how are you so calm? We've both been here for a while, a few days or so, but you've been sleeping. 
I've had time to digest it all, but this place doesn't allow stress to last very long. He slinks his way closer, running his body along mine, and the moment I feel his touch, my heart settles peacefully. We're okay? He nods and then tells me, We're not alone either. You mean Carnegie? Did you meet him? I did, but there's something else you're going to want to see. Who? Your brother. Pike? I perk up in astonishment. He's here? He's out with Carnegie right now, gathering berries. You talked to him? Yes, but don't worry. We've had a lot of time to reach an understanding with one another. He's not a bad guy, I immediately defend, and he stops me. I know that now. Come on, let's go find them. We maze around enormous flower stems and even more gigantic tree trunks as we scoot together, side by side. Every now and then Declan looks over to me and smiles, which makes me giggle. He's right. The stress doesn't last long. As I frolic along, I feel weightless. I feel exuberant. I feel free. This way, Declan tells me before we turn and weave our way through the wooden vines of a berry bush. It's a shortcut. I look up at the pink berries that are as big as basketballs, and when we come to an opening and make our way out, I see Carnegie, and next to him is a bright red caterpillar. Pike? You're awake. Pike! I slink as quickly as I can to him, and he does the same. I never thought I'd see you again, I tell him. You can't get rid of me, he jokes as he nudges his stumpy head into the side of my tubular body. You know, when you promised you'd do anything to get us a better life, I didn't think we'd have to be fucking caterpillars to get it. We both laugh, and Declan joins in as he sidles up next to me. Language, young man, Carnegie nags in his dapper British accent. I worm my way closer to my lifelong friend. Carnegie. It's been far too long, my dear. What is all this? Why, this is your afterlife. Nothing will ever hurt you again, because pain no longer exists. This is where dreams are reality. I told you it would all be okay, darling, Declan reaffirms. I release a pleased sigh and lean my head against Declan. Carnegie looks to us, asking, So this is love? Gazing into Declan's eyes, I respond, This is love. Declan and I continue to nuzzle each other tenderly while Carnegie and Pike are off by the pond's edge. Movement catches my eye, and when I turn to a tall bush next to me, an orange caterpillar appears. It stops and looks at me curiously, and then the beady eyes widen. Princess? My body sparks in bewilderment. Dad? He rushes over to me, his tiny mouth fighting for the biggest smile. What are you doing? Oh my God, he's dead. And suddenly I see his smile drop when realization hits him that I'm dead too. He stops moving, and when his eyes slip away from mine, he looks to Declan. What happened to you two? I hold my breath, not wanting my father to feel any guilt that I chose to pay the price for his past, that Declan did too. You tell me first. He scoots a little closer before saying, The brother of one of the guys I handed over to the feds ran me off the road right after I left the beach the last day we were together. He gave me a choice. He told me I could live and that he would kill you instead, or he could just kill me. My mouth gapes in shock. Obviously, I gave up my own life. There was never a choice, Declan tells him. What do you mean? That same man paid me and your daughter a visit with the same ultimatum. My dad's eyes dart back to me, and I tell him. I told him not to hurt you and to kill me instead. You sacrificed your life for me. I nod. Sweetheart. It's okay, Dad, I assure him. Can I ask you something, though? Anything. What was your biggest wish when you were living? The corners of his mouth lift. You he says. I always wished to have you in my life. My heart floats like a feather. And my wish was always you, Dad. My eyes mist over in pure delight. 
our wishes came true. I turned to face Declan and tell him in amazement, This is my every wish come true. The three of us look at one another as the truth crystallizes. We are a web of wishes come true. We no longer have to creep in the shadows of those who wish us harm. We are finally free from all that has ever haunted us. I know Declan and I would have never been able to find this kind of freedom among the living. It only exists here. I look around at the magnificently colored flowers that wisp in the breeze above us. I see Pike riding on the back of a dragonfly, happy and whimsical. And then there's Carnegie, who never has to be alone again because he has us now. I laugh as he watches in merriment at my brother flying around, and my dad, overflowing with boundless mirth as he kisses the top of my head. This is all I ever wanted, he tells me. I then turn to face Declan, amazed that our love was so powerful that not even death could part us, and then we kiss a kiss that's never existed until now. It's serene and vivacious and loving and entirely magical. This is everything dreams are made of. This is my fairy tale. This has been an Audible Studios production of Hush, written by E.K. Blair, performed by Elena Wolf, producer Mike Charzik. Copyright 2016, E.K. Blair. Production copyright 2016 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.